something is lurking in the forests of North America, man, ape, or other. And while most set their sights on vast remote wildernesses for answers, today's guest proves what incredible beings are closer to civilization than most assume. Take for example today's subject, the Bridgewater Triangle. If you would imagine, Bigfoot, swamp monsters, and little folk could thrive in such close quarters with the known world. Our guest Phil Anderson has done extensive travels through his home state of Massachusetts in search of everything from Puckwudgies, Poltergeist, to the Bridgewater Triangle Portal. And he joins me, Mystic Mark, here on the My Family Thinks I'm Crazy podcast to discuss what he's found. Thank you for tuning in and enjoy this conversation with Phil Anderson. Ladies and gentlemen, here we are back again on the My Family Thinks I'm Crazy podcast, and I am very excited to have this gentleman here with us, fellow New Englander, friend of a friend of the show from way back. Uh, He goes way back with our good friend Tony Merkel, host of the uh, Paramount Paranormal podcast. I think it's number one in the paranormal business, the Confessionals podcast. He's doing a great job. And Tony endorsed this gentleman uh, with two thumbs up, says he's a great guy. I'm excited to have him on the show. We have with us today Phil from the Exploring with Phil YouTube channel. And uh, I heard word that there may be a podcast on the way or already one going. So we're going to learn more about that today and uh, learn a little bit about my neck of the woods, Phil's neck of the woods, New England. Phil? Welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Good, Mark. A pleasure and honor to be on your podcast. I'm excited to get into, I mean, we have like a thousand things to talk about and like, I just feel like time's just shrinking, but um, yes, thank you for having me on your show. I do weekly uh, YouTube videos every single Thursday, 7 PM, usually Bridgewater Triangle. Sometimes I venture out into other areas, but generally speaking, paranormal investigations, a little bit of a abandoned exp- exploration, which usually turns into paranormal investigations as well, just because, uh, I don't know, I feel like when you start investigating, you start opening yourself up to just having paranormal experiences all the time. At least that's what it is for me when I film. It doesn't matter where I am. I just feel like, you know, even if I'm not trying to do paranormal stuff, paranormal stuff happens anyway. Do you know what I mean? So it's just one of those things. So that's been how how it's been lately but yes i'm going to be on a podcast as well bi-monthly podcast uh afk discussions uh with jason and ty they're the original host they asked me to come on um just a couple times a month you know guys a third man in that sort of thing talk about some of the um things i'm doing as far as research investigating and not only that talk about other paranormal topics so that's kind of where you know what i'm doing what where you can find me all awesome. that kind of stuff, but we have so much to talk about. Yeah, awesome, <laughs> and I'll link all of that in the description for folks who are tuning in. And uh, yeah, Phil, you've put an incredible amount of videos out on your YouTube channel, all on this uh, very specific and interesting topic, the Bridgewater Triangle. Something that recently, I mean, it o- I think it only really came to my attention uh, when I started this podcast, people had the, uh, I guess, the suggestion to look into it after learning I lived in New England. I must have heard of it before, but as a guy who grew up in the southern part of Connecticut, it really didn't, uh, it didn't, it didn't kind of, I never really went over there. I remember going to Salem as a kid and doing the whole witch trial field trip. And, but the Bridgewater Triangle's in a kind of unique area. It's out in the sort of, uh, kind of armpit, if you will, of Massachusetts, where Rhode Island and Massachusetts meet. No offense to anyone who lives in that area, but Phil, are you from the specific Bridgewater Triangle? Like, is your hometown in that area, or are you from a, a, an area n- nearby? Tell us about, you know, the area sure. and how you first got introduced to, you know, studying this stuff. So I grew up primarily in Onset, Massachusetts, which is like south 
southeast of where the Bridgewater Triangle is proper. Now, I would say it's obviously like not an exact science when it comes to the Bridgewater Triangle. Like there's a lot of paranormal activity that happens throughout Massachusetts and New England. It just seems to be that and within the triangle or near the triangle area, it's just a larger concentration of those things. Um, but my interest in the Bridgewater Triangle, I would honestly say started much later in life because like you're saying, with the Bridgewater Triangle, it really didn't become a household name or even a term until the documentary back in 2015, I believe is when the documentary came out. It's available on Amazon to watch for free if you have a Prime account. It's a great documentary if you don't know if you don't know anything about the Bridgewater Triangle, it goes into the various claims, different sites and stuff like that. So it's a very good like beginner's way to get into the Bridgewater Triangle as a topic. Um, highly recommend it. It's great. That's where my interest started, is specifically in the Bridgewater Triangle. Because growing up, I mean, you would never hear like stuff like that. I mean, I you know, I was born in, you know, the 80, 84, you know, so like growing up it was unsolved mysteries which once every five or six episodes of Unsolved Mysteries, you get like a paranormal one or something. And so you'd be like, this is great. You know, that'd be the only real like legitimate, well, back in those days, legitimate thing you could see on ghosts or anything paranormal. Everything else is so fringe. So anything like Bridgewater Triangle or UFOs, any of that stuff was like not really talked about. Um, obviously, I would see like books about ghosts and stuff like that. And so like my interest with ghosts started at a young age. I had like a paranormal experience when I was very young where I heard it, heard something like a glass break and someone talk and there's no one around me, no one in the room there. I would go run downstairs and tell my mom, you know, and that was the paranormal experience. But that's kind of like what got me into the paranormal was as a young age, obviously that paranormal experience. And then, you know, seeing that like, oh, there's books about ghosts. And so like, oh, maybe there's something going on. So I always had that in my mind growing up. And then when I got older, obviously, the Bridgewater Triangle documentary was huge for me. And then once I saw that and then the Pukwudgie angle of everything, and I became aware of what a Pukwudgie was and what they look like, I kind of put two and two together because my uncle had this experience in the early 80s where he saw this troll-like creature and it vanished in front of his eyes. And like every single characteristic and thing he told me about the experience matched right up with what a Pukwudgie is and does and all that stuff. So that's where my interest, I guess, in the Bridgewater Triangle, Pukwudgies, and kind of all stems from. And then I would say back in 2021, when I started my channel, um, back in those days, I was like into, obviously I've been into the paranormal for my whole life and stuff like that, but um, I was really into like Randonautica at the time, had just come out and it was a big sensation and all this stuff. So I was trying to like debunk it or like trying to figure out what was going on with it so that's kind of how my youtube channel started and then that kind of turned into doing paranormal investigations because i was like well if this randonautica app's evil let me take it to a haunted location so i started taking it to the huckamock swamp freetown state forest these are all locations within the bridgewater triangle and so that's kind of how my youtube channel started and then that eventually turned into me getting more into the Bridgewater Triangle, less into Randonautica, and more into the stories and Pukwudgies and learning more about them and the history, King Philip's War, all that stuff. Because um, I, I find that when you investigate historical locations and you start talking about the past or the history at the location, the past comes alive. Mm -hmm. And it's really strange and weird how that happens, but... It does. Oh, and it's yeah. very, very strange. But like that and like the fastest way possible, that's kind of like how my interests got into the Bridgewater Triangle and the paranormal. I love general. that. Yeah. And I would love to have you on my uh, other podcast, Esoteric America, maybe to talk just about the history of that area, Massachusetts, maybe even New England in general. But it's such a fascinating uh, area of research when it comes to you know, supernatural things in your own backyard. And that's really what Esoteric America began as, is a sort of invitation for people to do that and then join us on the show and tell us what they found. And, you know, different people find different things. And you certainly seem to have a, a track record of being, you know, uh, magnetically attracted to these paranormal situations, whether you want to or not. I remember hearing one of uh, the stories you told Tony on your first appearance on the confessionals where you, you left church. Your, your mother was talking to someone in a parking lot and you saw this very demonic looking entity behind the wheel of uh, your family vehicle. And, uh, you know, it, 
quickly um, sort of passed after you brought attention to it and your mother and her friend prayed. Has this theme kind of pervade your spiritual beliefs as well? Because you talk about going to demonic and haunted areas. I don't really get like the kind of vibe that you would expect from someone who's interested in that. You're a very positive, upbeat person. No offense to anybody who is doing ghost hunting stuff, but the haunted vibe, you know, it's like people who are into horror movies, maybe goth culture. And I don't know, you seem like a straight lace kind of guy, at least from what I r- listened to, you know, with your conversations with Tony, I know Tony enough to kind of see, you know, that there's a sort of Christian angle to a lot of uh, the way he sees the paranormal. Do you find the same is true for you? Oh, for sure. And um, obviously the paranormal experience I've had like throughout my life, like obviously reinforced that Mm. Um, because the way I look at it before I even did one ghost investigation or anything like that, I had a myriad of spiritual attacks in my life throughout my life or experienced or seen other people under attack in various situations and stuff. So like at all seeing those things, I always knew that like God was real, at least for me personally, because it, it being thrown into some uh, some sort of a a dark experience like that, you rely on your faith or whatever that may be. And for me, it's you know faith in God and Jesus and all that stuff. So in those moments, you know you rely on him or you know your faith and stuff. And so it's just it's those experiences um, like shape who you are for sure, and, sh- and and like strengthen your faith, especially when you come out on the other side and you're like, I'm fine, like. I'm not going to die. Like this thing's not going to kill me. Like, and you, then you, the, cause a lot of people, even Christians are like, they're like, Oh, don't bring up demons. Like I'm, they're definitely afraid of them. And it's like the Lord Jesus Christ gives you power. Like if you're a Christian, that is, it gives you power over these things. You don't have to be afraid of them. You don't have, I mean, obviously don't antagonize them and don't like go after them and be like, Oh, I'm coming for you. You know what I'm saying? Like, but like within reason, you know, like you should not be afraid of them. And so as a kid, you're always afraid of stuff like that. And so these experiences would happen to me, I'd be deathly afraid. And then, um, you know, I'd pray and then they go away. And so after so many experiences like that, and especially, um, with the one with my, um, roommate, that whole thing, like that was really a moment where I was like, wow, I was like, God really like came through there. So, That's why I'm not like afraid of that kind of stuff. And so that's how my world, like my, even within the Christian world, my world, like my view of, of like ghosts and all these things, there's like even divisions within Christians. There are some Christians that think what I do is wrong as far as like using the spirit box or using technology to try to like communicate. Cause there's some people, everyone's different. Everyone thinks differently. So some people think that like all ghosts are demons and that sort of thing. So like, why would you talk to a demon? So, whereas I'm not fully convinced that every single thing out there is a demon, you know what I mean? I think there's obviously many different things out there. There's people, there's these Pakwajis, there's other entities, there's faith folk, probably there's like a myriad of different things. And just to classify them all as one thing is probably not, the right way to go about it. You know what I mean? Like, that's just my personal opinion. So it's just strange. Even in like my world, there's like many different views as far as like Christians and stuff. Um, So yeah, it's, it's really weird and strange, but you would think, I mean, maybe not, but you would think that most people would be, uh, I don't know, like, especially Christians would be like more open Mm. to other Christians and stuff like that. But they're, believe me, they are just as mean to other Christians as they are to oh. non-Christians, you know, like, oh, and that's no just doubt. my experience, like, you know, throughout the, you know, there's good people obviously in church and stuff like that. And, you know, but like people sometimes get caught in their own way of thinking that anyone else that challenges their way of thinking obviously is wrong. And right. I need to tell them that they're wrong. You know what I mean? That sort of. Well, and part of the whole, <laughs> you know, movement of Puritans, pilgrims and whatnot to uh, New England, was predicated on that you know, subjugation that they were experiencing in Europe, right? Where the Anglican Church in in England and you know, other uh, Catholic and different you know monarch Im- imposed religions were sort of stifling certain groups like the Protestants and 
they came over and, you know, sort of did the same thing that they were upset about happening to them in, in Europe. And I, I think, you know, Christians are not alone in that. I think that's just a human thing. But it is fascinating, especially when it comes to New England, because it is a melting pot of many different spiritual beliefs still to this day. Uh, and even back when a lot of the stuff that New England's well known for was occurring. You know, people have this sort of idea that it was just Indians and pilgrims when, you know, Tichiba, one of the key figures behind the whole Salem witch trial, she was from the Caribbean, right? So uh, from the beginning of, of this New England experiment, if you will, there were uh, many different spiritual beliefs and cultures mixing together. And one of the fascinating things that occurred during this time period was as the Native Americans and the pilgrims, for lack of a better term, the settlers, uh, sort of commingled and described, you know, each other's understanding of the world one of the things that they would do they would name places and tell each other about different experiences at places and one of the side effects of this is we have now all these places around new england called you know devils this and satan's this i myself just recently moved down the road from a place that's historically been called satan's kingdom and some people say that's because the river goes through some rough rapids over these rocks and it's just a, a, a rapid you know a, a treacherous sort of dangerous river to to travel down i've also heard other more interesting uh, stories maybe we can get into later on but when it comes to the bridgewater triangle and like the area you grew up in were there any sort of uh local folklore or, or legends name place names that hinted at this kind of paranormal reality that the first sort of English speaking people to come here experienced? Um, I think one of those places is definitely as far as documented would definitely be Huckamuck Swamp. Cause like you said, um, a lot of like pilgrims, early settlers in any place that had any sort of paranormal things happening at, they would often name it like devil something. So they called the Huckamuck Swamp Devil Swamp, um, which is interesting, kind of goes right into what you're talking about there. Now, the reason why I think they probably called it Devil Swamp is because of the paranormal activity there. Because the word Huckamuck literally translates to a uh, place where spirits dwell. Mm. So even within the name itself, it's like, so even when the, the Wampanoags were there doing their thing, um, whatever they did in the swamp. Now, there's many people theorize. I mean, obviously, they used it to escape their enemies. Anything, any like King Philip's War account you see, they always use a swamp to escape, which tells me that they had a, a deep understanding of how the swamps were, where to walk in the swamp, where not to walk. Like they seemed like they knew the swamps, all the swamps, very very well because they used them to their advantage. So they obviously used it as for ceremonial purposes. They use it for many purposes. And for them to call it place where spirits dwell, that tells me that it's a place where there's always been paranormal activity, even back when the pilgrims were there. So to have the pilgrims call it Devil Swamp tells me that obviously the pilgrims maybe either chase some Wampanoags out into the swamp over there because that's what they would often do. You know, they would often like, you know, because the Wampanoags would use it to escape through and stuff so the pilgrims just go as far as they could that you know shoot at them and stuff obviously right and so they must have experienced something out there that would give them a reason to call it the devil swamp and not want to go in there right, right. so yeah so that begs the question like with all this paranormal activity in the bridgewater triangle because some people will say like oh this is all all this paranormal activity is because of king philip's war all of this paranormal activity is because of a curse that the native americans put on the land and there's no actual documentation of that. There's no, you know, that's just pe things people say. And the way I look at it, number one, I don't think a neighbor, like a Wampanoag would curse their own land. You know, like they, if anything, they would curse the people, not their own land. That doesn't make sense to me personally. Um, even if they were losing a war when they still have other um, of their tribes members in different parts of Massachusetts still alive and thriving and doing well. I don't know. It's just, it just doesn't seem that they would do that. And I've caught no evidence of that. Like, so I just think this area in general, just like the stones you, you talk about with like the ley lines and all that stuff. I think there's obviously some sort of similar thing with places like the Huckamuck Swamp, the Bridgewater Triangle in general, that's causing this place to either be 
amplified somehow or like it has its own energy or whatever. It's obviously things are manifesting and happening here. So there's got to be some sort of power source or something causing all these things to happen, you right. know? And it's definitely interesting once you start getting into like what you things you get into with ley lines and stuff like that. And then the stone structures, cause there are stone structures within the Bridgewater triangle. And a lot of them like, yes, there's Anawan rock, which is a really awesome spot. There's Abrams rock. These are like pudding stones, basically left over from glaciers and stuff like that. Well, at least that's what they say. Left over from glaciers and stuff like that. And, you know, there's a lot of other stone formations that I've noticed uh, near certain sites that are haunted, like right. Freetown State Forest, right? Bridgewater Triangle. There's this one spot. Uh, has a huge rock in the in the middle, and they call it Profile Rock. There used to be a profile of a man's face on it um, from the, the side. And so now the face has fallen off, so it's no longer there, kind of like the man on the mountain up in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. Very similar, but much more deliberate. Almost like, I mean, it could have been carved, but it looked like a, a man's face, like really like a Native American man's face, which right. is very interesting. Um, so like that place I caught EVPs at, um, had its own energy at, and it's all around this rock, you know what I mean? Which begs the question, is it the land? Is this rock part of it? You know, I big big question like as far as nature in general, the rocks and like I've even had evidence of trees being powerful in some sort of way, even dead rotten trees. Yeah, you, you have know? A, a video so, uh, about the the witching tree that I want to talk about at some point, but it's really interesting to get your take on the place names because I feel like this is kind of like we're kind of giving people the the basic toolkit, right? And I want to get into the more uh, sophisticated tools that you use, but it's important, I think, to point that out for people is like something as simple as like a place name is a tool in this type of research. And a map obviously holds all those place names, a good map at least, right? And books with their stories and history of those places will yield all sorts of really interesting information that will point you even to places that don't exist anymore. I mean, one notable tree that no longer exists is the Charter Oak, where the uh, the Constitution was uh, kept. I think it was the early version of the Constitution, and they hid it there so that the uh, British wouldn't uh, take it over. Well, we're trying to take over all of New England, and Connecticut was like, no, you can't have our charter. And that charter went and, uh, you know basically informed what would become the constitution but anyways a little nerd moment for me there but maps history books incredibly important tools in this type of research but there there are some tools that you've mentioned already that i'm a little unfamiliar with randonautica i remember using i had some weird results that kind of turned me away from using it uh not anything super personal but just like taking me on like kind of uh like out of my way and it ended up like affecting things that I necessarily uh, weren't planning on affecting in the sense that I realized like maybe I shouldn't be wasting my time following this app around and get to what's important, <laughs> like my responsibilities. So I stopped using Randonautica because I felt like I was going on a wild goose chase, but I have heard people say kind of disturbing things uh, from their experiences with Randonautica. And you mentioned just before having, uh, you know, taking this into haunted places. I think that's a really uh, wise way to use something like that, given, you know, what people are reporting uh, with the right intentions, of course. Uh, <laughs> so Randonautica, did that kind of introduce you to the idea of augmenting your paranormal investigations? Had you used any type of tool to to uh, investigate prior to that? Um, well, yeah, what's really weird about that is, so before I did the YouTube, I only did one investigation where I did it actually on my own, and I just had, like, bare bones. I had my phone as my camera. I had my iPhone, my uh, iPad as, like, had an app on it, has, like, an app on it that I used still to this day, actually. But, like, you know, very bare bones. And so then fast forward to me doing Randonautica, I even within my first few random randonautica videos, I didn't even start ghost hunting until probably like four or five randonautica videos in. I kind of was like, well, why don't I just start doing EVP sessions? Why don't I like do these intentions and then 
do an EVP session at that spot where I do the intention. Like, so then it kind of, that's where I kind of developed the paranormal aspect of it and started doing the investigations with the Randonautica. So like when I first started out, it was just Randonautica and then the paranormal kind of came into it along the way. And so I used to use, I used to do things like, um, as far as intentions, I do like puck wudgie or I do like paranormal or, um, you know, it's things like that. And it would take me to different spots and, um, which yielded some interesting results here or there. The last time I used it in the Huckamuck Swamp, I had the intention of paranormal and it brought me to the spot where I don't really no- go normally. And, um, I asked the question in the spirit box, which we can get into all the equipment, but I asked the question in the spirit box and it was like, uh, cause I kept on getting responses like, um, bodies were removed from the swamp. Basically that's what the impression I was getting that like. Because it said bodies removed, like removed over and over and over. And I was like, who removed bodies from the swamp in the spirit box? And without skipping a beat, it said witch. And the witch, I mean, like I meaning like a witch or some sort of person or whatever, which could mean many different things. But that's the last time I used right in Anatica. Um, as far as an intention, my intention was paranormal. Took me to that spot. I asked the question and that's what happened. Um, so it's interesting. It, it it yields interesting results. I'd say the synchronicities is probably the most interesting part of it. Right. Um, and it doesn't, it's not always like I, the thing I would say about it is it gives you like a, a little bit better chance than random at finding what you're looking for. Right. You know, essentially, yeah. I mean, but there is a few synchronicities, a few things happened here or there that were interesting. Um, I don't think it's evil necessarily, but, um, Definitely interesting because, you know, when it's interesting when you put in the whole thing of like and setting your intention and, you know, does your intention matter? You know, it's like, I don't know. I still don't know what to think of the app, but um, definitely interesting, though. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, you know, it definitely with any tool or or technology, there's a certain amount of user error involved, if we will call it that. So, you know, what you find is reflected in you in a way. Right. So if you're finding something i think one of the more sensational stories was a woman like was taken uh by randonautica to like a uh, the site where a body had been disposed and you know got involved in this whole like criminal case and you know i don't recommend anybody do that but maybe that says more about what her intentions were than the app itself right so i think we gotta definitely have those sorts of intentions but when it comes to a spirit box um sort of an interesting concept so let me get this straight you have a keyboard of some kind and you're able to communicate messages and receive responses right i mean that's basically what's going on with the spirit box i'm sure there's more to that but can you explain sort of the the concept there and maybe sure and why you started using it sure yeah um yeah as far as a spirit box a spirit box is essentially a radio um, FM and FM and AM, and you can use either band. It's all based on personal preference. So basically the theory behind a spirit box is if you move, um, the dial really fast back and forth, this is basically someone had discovered this while paranormal investigating a long, long time ago that you, they were able to hear like ghostly voices come through the radio somehow. So the spirit box was developed off that theory. So basically this, how the spirit box works is, how I use it is I turn it on and there's a, like I said, you can do AM or FM. I personally use FM. You could go forwards or backwards. It all depends on how you want to use it. Like there's many different ways to use it. I use it forwards and I use it on like the fastest speed possible. So we're talking, it's, it's going so fast that you can't, you might be able to get one word out out of a radio station, but that's pretty much about it. If that, if you're lucky. So it, it'll just like scan through the radio stations. Now, if, there's like no paranormal activity going on or it, even if you're in a place where like you're on top of a mountain and there's no radio stations, it'll, if there's no paranormal things going on, it'll just be like static or mumbo jumbo. You can't really make anything out. Now, when there you get communication, there'll be voices that'll come over through multiple bands of that, um, uh, like a voice, sometimes longer, sometimes sentences. Depends on your spirit box and how your spirit box works. My spirit box will, if it catches a voice, it sometimes will stay on that radio station a little bit longer. If it if it feels like there's something there to kind of give you a fuller um, response. Now, recently, I will say this. This was interesting. 
So I did an experiment recently with two spirit boxes, same spirit box, same model, everything. We put them in a Honolulu, uh, allegedly haunted location. Afterwards, we got a bunch of EVPs, so I'm pretty sure it's haunted. So we were in the middle of the home. We put them on this fireplace right next to each other. We hit them at the same time, so that way they're cycling through the same thing. And we turn them both up. We caught like two full long sentences from the both spirit boxes, like the same voice, but because they're synced up. Like and literally the the one sentence because I remember I can remember it's off the top of my head because it's just such a weird sentence. It said uh, it was a male voice and it said it doesn't smell like I punched you in the face. And that's a long sentence to get. You know what I mean? There's no way that's a radio station. You know, like I don't care what anybody says. There's no way that's a radio station because <laughs> like that's a long sentence to get. And like the way the spirit box works, by the time that sentence is done, you'd already be all the way through the the band of like, you know, 88.1 to whatever, 105.9 or whatever the last thing is. Um, but yeah, so that's something I've done recently where it's like, that's interesting. It and seemed it, to like almost amplify the the power of the spirit box somehow. I don't, like I said, I don't know how it works. It just works. Now, um, so, yeah. now it's an audible signal when you say sentence, because when I'm hearing about this stuff on podcasts, I guess I just pictured in my mind like almost like a, a keyboard type of thing and you're getting like a sentence typed out. But this is actually like you're speaking and things are speaking back, basically, whatever yeah. these entities yep. are. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I don't know how a uh, punch smells, but maybe they meant to say feel because, I mean, I'm sure most people have had the experience uh, in a dream where you go and throw a punch and it doesn't feel like you threw a punch. And something I often wonder with certain paranormal experiences is, are these people beyond the veil? You know, some people who didn't make it uh, beyond to the next life, if that's possible, or uh, heaven, or however the, the afterlife works, maybe there's an aspect to it where they almost feel like they're dreaming, right? Their body is long gone, but they're in their astral dream sort of form and, uh, you know, just kind of stumbling about in their old home or, you know, the old trope of like, you know, oh, my house is haunted and it's this old lady who used to live here kind of thing, right? I, I think that's kind of a common conception of this, but uh, yeah, the idea that it would want to hit you might be frightening, right? I mean, like something saying, I don't know, it doesn't smell like I punch you. Like, did, what did you say back? Like, well, did you, why would you want to punch me? <laughs> In the moment, we weren't quite sure what it said. Um, so like listening back, it was much more clear. Right. And that's usually how the spirit box is. Like, as you get better at the spirit box, you can hear more in the moment. Mm. Like, like I said, I use it on the fastest speed possible to avoid radio stations coming through as much as possible. Okay. Um, so like sometimes in the moment, it's like hard to, or sometimes you'll hear it, you'll hear one word or a phrase and you'll have that in your mind and then you miss the next three or four mm. because you're concentrated on the one thing that you, that you, that you heard. You're like, Oh, I heard that. Right. And so, you know, cause as you're scanning through, I'll, I'll probably let it scan through for like, I'll ask a question, turn it on and I'll let it play through maybe. 50 seconds at the most or so. So I'll like, even if there's responses in there, I'll let it keep on going. Mm. Um, so like, yeah, so sometimes it's difficult in the moment. Um, like, yeah. And, and the spirit box is one, is one of the most interesting tools for sure. And it's one of those things that like, when I first got it, I didn't really use it a lot. And then I started using it more and more. And then I'm trying to, remember, I think anal one rock actually is when I started using it like every single video because I just got wild um evidence there um right. the first time i had went there it was like i kept on getting uh leave go home go away leave like repeatedly like so clear that even nicole who's more of a skeptic my fiance who was filming me is like it said it again you know what i mean just like repeatedly repeatedly right. so that was one of the first times i was like well, okay this is like there's no way this is the radio you know this is some like something else coming through and i've had some strange um well, like I've had good, good and bad things come through. You know, I've had things like uh, "We Love You, Philip," or you know, "Phil is awesome." Like I said on Tony's show, that happened. Like that's that's like you know, so there is positives. Like it's not all bad, but um, the spirit box is a great tool. I also use something called a word bank, which is probably more than what what you were thinking of as far as like uh, something typing out. So the word bank is somewhat similar. Theoretically, how it works is ghosts can somehow use the app or use the word bank within the phone 
and it'll pick a word and it'll display that word basically um a lot of other people call them obvious ovuluses that's another name for uh the product um, but basically they're all the same it's just like a word bank it has a built-in number of words inside the machine or um, app whatever you're using and entities ghosts whatever can pick those words now when i first got it just like everyone else i'm like like how how legitimate is this so i've had many occasions where i've had like like, for example, at Anawan Rock, I got the word bank response here, H-E-A-R. Three seconds later, I catch an EVP that says, hear me. Hmm. You know, so here I have on the machine that says here. A couple seconds later, I catch an EVP right. that's someone that says, hear me. So it's like <laughs> right. it's two things correlating with like something. Obviously, they wanted to be heard. So it's like so like that kind of stuff. It's like, whoa, that's pretty unbelievable. Or I've had instances where you get a name on the word bank open up the spirit box, you get that name on the spirit box. Mm. And it's like, well, either way, there's something intelligent there happening because either, <laughs> either, either way, it's something intelligent happening. Either if like an entity heard it and is repeating it, that's great. It's, it's still something there talking and saying the same thing that came through on the machine, or it's that same person who, whatever the case may be, it's obviously something happening because, you're getting it across multiple devices. And when that's when I think you get the best parental evidence is when you get multiple devices saying the same thing or you ask a question and all of a sudden, like a, like a device like the Re, a REM pod, which is basically a device that um, it gauges temperature changes, it gauges electromagnetic field changes, and it also is touch-based. So if you touch it, it goes off. If there's a change in EMF, it goes off. If there's a change in temperature, it goes off. So like there's multiple things that'll set it off. So if you ask a question that all of a sudden that thing goes off and it hasn't gone off the whole time, you know, and there's no other logical reason why it should go off, you know, obviously you try to debunk it and stuff like that. Yeah. But then you couple that with if something else happens, you know, so like if that's why it's great to have as many things as you ha can have, you know, that you can measure and be like, yes, you know, because obviously the Holy Grail will be catching something on film as far as like, a ghost in front of me or a pukwaji or something obviously like people could people are still going to try to debunk it anyway but like that's holy grail but all these other things if you add them up together it's pretty impressive as far as evidence goes you know absolutely that's and i think what is really cool about the devices you're describing is they're kind of counterintuitive in the sense that uh, most people would expect the, the tools maybe to be like a camera for catching this stuff in a way that you would, you know, be able to show other people. Whereas this is in the sense that you're more trying to catch an imprint of something else being out there, uh, being able to manipulate things like a, a random number generator with words attached to each number. I mean, that's something that scientists have studied when it comes to like global phenomena. They notice that random number generators will sp spike with certain numbers when certain events are going on. And so I think that there's certainly science to this all it might not sound scientific the way we normally understand the paradigm today but that's just because science is behind when it comes to a lot of this fringe paranormal stuff you know it's it's still catching up to fully understanding this world this reality we're living in and when it comes to something like a camera i wonder if it's even in the same field of uh light you know, if it even captures the right field of light that these entities exist in, right? Because we're aware that there's a whole field of colors beyond ultraviolet that we're, you know, they're just imperceivable to our eye. Maybe there are certain human beings who have an ability to perceive that, and that's what accounts for, you know, these visions of these creatures. Uh, or maybe there are certain areas that have a higher frequency that facilitate this uh in us you know i recently had joshua cutchin on the podcast and he was talking about a droning sound that people notice with certain paranormal encounters and he compared that to altered states of consciousness the kind experienced under maybe hallucinogenic or psychedelic drugs people report hearing a droning uh noise right before seeing something you know hallucinate hallucinatory right and maybe there's areas like these swamps that 
have an association with spirits where the frequency is different. I mean, you have a ton of water in a swamp. You have gases moving about. You have all sorts of different processes going on of decomposition, different materials like, you know, I mean, who knows what. And also iron. Bog iron is something that, you know, was one of the early metallurgy um you know, sources, right? Before people really figured out mining in certain parts of the world, they would pull these huge chunks of iron out of swamps and turn it into tools and whatnot. And, you know, iron has a kind of paranormal fairy lore tale around it. So conversely, swamps might too, if they're the type of swamp or bog that creates this iron and you got whole loads of iron at the bottom of the swamp, you know, maybe that's attracting some sort of, um, spirit through the energy the magnetism the the frequency that 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 type of material might uh you know carry with it yeah it certainly seems that swamps for sure whatever the whatever if, it, if it's the iron or for whatever the case may be there seems to be some sort of connection there for sure mm. um because i was listening to this i can never give it credit because it was just like a a random listen i ran a list, random listen listen to this podcast that tony was on and the guy was talking about a swamp in louisiana and literally all the claims, I don't even have to tell you because they're the same claims as the Hockamuck Swamp, like like the Bigfoot stuff, you know, the the cryptid creatures, like the little people, like every single thing that he mentioned was like the exact same claim, which got my mind thinking there's got to be some sort of connection here. You know what I mean? There's obviously a connection between these swamps and these paranormal events. So that got my mind thinking, like, I wonder if... If I would have went to, I was talking about my buddy about this, if I would go to some random swamp somewhere that doesn't really have any paranormal activity associated with it, maybe historically or legend wise, just some random swamp somewhere. And if I busted out my spirit box and did some paranormal stuff, like would I get the same sort of activity? You know what I mean? Makes you wonder if there's some sort of connection there with swamps in general, whatever it is, there seems to be some sort of something yeah. with that, well, you I, know? So like I pinpointing like it is interesting, but... You know, I don't know. I love that idea. And I think that kind of harkens back to the way humans used to see the world and maybe still do in less uh, modern, we'll say, parts of the world. Not that that might not, that might not be the most appropriate term, but you know, the, uh, this mythic view of our landscape has certainly kind of left the Western civilization. You know, a lot of the European folklore, you know, certain, landscapes would have certain beings associated with it rivers would have this type of spirit mountains would have this type of spirit swamp surely had this type of spirit right and so on and so forth and a, a whole variety of creatures associated with those spots too so yeah i think america and north america south america in general you know there's this like maybe unscathed wilderness that's still here that maybe just is too domesticated in other parts of the world or there's language barriers in place where we're just not privy to the folklore. But I think the, the truth is that, yeah, swamps, mountains, all of these places have uh, their own special supernatural biome, if you will. Right. And a whole slew of creatures associated with it, like swamps having a, all sorts of these legends. I mean, there's even a Sasquatch specific to swamps called the skunk ape, right? I mean, at least in Florida. So, yeah, I think that's a really fascinating, you know, kind of area to look at. But when we, uh, when we go a little further into your research, you've had some incredible experiences at the Hockamock Swamp. Is that right? Can we get into some of that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what would you like to hear about first, like some Pukwudgie stuff? Yeah, let's um, let well yeah. let's let's get into the Pukwudgies. Maybe let's bring up because I also heard a story of like a phantom wolf. If I got that, or maybe just a regular sure. wolf. I don't know yeah. exactly, but tell me about that one, and then we'll move into the Pukwudgies. Sure, sure. So, um, for those people who don't know, the Huckamuck Swamp is probably I would say the heart of the Bridgewater Triangle. It's probably central, most centrally located uh, spot in the triangles you could get. And it's comprised of at least four or five towns. So it's a very large, large area. Most of it is inaccessible um, via canoes and boats and stuff like that. So it's just a vast area where even non-paranormal 
things like as far as animals there there's many reports of many different animals being in there that aren't supposed to be there um obviously black panthers um big cats big wolves uh, big beavers which is something you had mentioned before in some of your uh, legends and stuff too there's someone that messaged me actually recently and was like i think there could be possibly big beavers in the huckamuck swamp so that's another angle of just like uh, animals on of unusual size you know animals that just aren't supposed to be there stuff like that so that's more of the natural size stuff because there was even i'll tell you a quick little story about the huckamuck so when they were building the power lines that go through the Huckamuck Swamp, which is basically how I access this, the majority of the area of the Huckamuck Swamp, because when they put these power lines in, obviously they backfill the land. And so that way they'd have dry land to put this in because they literally went right through the swamp. Because back in those days, they're like, whatever, we need a straight shot. And this is the straight shot. We're going through the swamp. And back in those days, back when they built it, no one really cared. So there was no one to stop them. So they you know, built, put these power lines in. And so that's essentially how I can navigate um, this one particular area of the swamp. And thank God they put those in there because otherwise there would be very little area that we could access. Um, so Huckamuck Swamp, there is just a lot uh, as far as paranormal claims that go in there into the Huckamuck Swamp. Like I said, the animal stuff, obviously many different ghostly apparitions, ghostly experiences, UFOs, you name it. So this particular occasion I was in, uh, part of the Huckamuck Swamp I had, at this point, had never been to before. Um, like I said, the Huckamuck Swamp is very large. So there's many different entrance entrances, different parts of the swamp, different towns have different spots, different areas you can access. So this particular spot was near where I had been before, but I just had never been there before just because I didn't know this entrance existed. So it was an area where it was more of a wooded area, which then led into the swamp from that point. So it's basically just like a, a, a one person trail. There's a parking lot, a one person trail that leads you straight back in. And there's a swamp basically to the right hand side if you're walking in. And the further you get in, the closer the swamp will get to you. And then eventually the swamp's like right there on your right hand side. And then you're kind of like in the midst of the swamp. And then there's other pathways that lead out. So anyway, on this particular, which is actually a little over a year ago to or this week or something, because it was during Christmas time when I had, had this experience. So I, like I said, first time out there, I'm walking down the pathway like I always do in the Huckamuck Swamp and other areas. And like I'm, you know, no, I, you know, I, when I first went to Huckamuck, I felt uneasy, um, just because it's just there's a lot of paranormal stuff happening there. So like you kind of get in your head, and so. You know, if you if you're when you're by yourself in a allegedly haunted location for the first time, you're gonna have, you know, you're gonna feel like uneasy. So I'm starting to get this feeling like I shouldn't be there, which I'd never really gotten before and haven't really gotten since. And so literally in my head, I hear, "You shouldn't be here," and I'm like, "That's kind of weird." <laughs> and so I just kind of ignore it, and I'm just like, "Whatever." I'm just gonna keep on walking. You know, I'm I'm thinking, okay, well maybe I felt this way when I first went here the Huckamuck and other areas, like maybe I'm just psyching myself out, you know, then I get the, like, I get that feeling again in my head, like you shouldn't be here. And so then I'm like, all right, I have to at least mention this on camera just because I'm feeling weird. I've never had this feeling before. Let me mention it. So I mentioned on camera, but I keep on going. So I get to this part where to my right is where the swamp is about mm, 70 feet back is the swamp back that way to my right. I turn to my left and as far as the eye could see, about a football field's worth are like, not every single tree's down, but I would say the majority of the trees that are in this area are down. Um, a lot of them have the roots that are like ripped up with them. So it has like the black circle um, on the back of them and stuff like that. And so I'm kind of looking at the area and I'm like, man, like it looks like a tornado ripped through here. And I'm like thinking to myself, I'm like, well, it's like winter. I know there really hasn't. I just was like, oh, it's kind of weird and strange. And so I was like, oh, whatever. So I, uh, I'm like, all right, let me do a spirit box. I've never been here before. Let me see if there's any sort of spirits here, any sort of ghost activity, whatever. So I shut the camera off, which I never do anymore for this exact reason because of what happens next. So I get the spirit box. I'm about to turn it on. And I like look up and over the back of one of these trees, like the, the circle part. Now it's happened so fast. So I don't know if it, cleared it or if it jumped on top and then jumped over i just saw the back half of it jumping down and then jumping onto the ground 
but I saw what looked like a wolf slash coyote. But I mean, I've seen coyotes before, so I know what coyotes look like. This didn't look like a coyote to me. It looked like bigger than a coyote. And it was like fluffy, extremely fluffy, like fluffy, fl- like, I don't know. It just the, like and black too. You know, it was like black, really fluffy. And as soon as I saw it, I had never had so much fear like come over me in an instant before in a moment like that, especially paranormal investigating that. Yeah. Like literally my fight or flight instincts kicked in, which is very, um, you know, strange. I mean, it's, I guess it, to see wolf, you know, like that or whatever it was, coyote, koi wolf. I'm not exactly sure what it was. Uh, my best guess is it could be a koi wolf. Cause after that video came out after this experience, because, uh, spoiler alert, I did not stick around. <laughs> as soon as I saw that thing, I literally was gone, and I didn't um, I didn't go back till like, a week later um, with, like, backup and stuff because I wasn't going to go back there alone. Um, but I was talking to the guy that had let me know that that spot was over there because he lives near that area. And he was like, I've seen them before. And he's like, there's, like, ten of them. And I think he's like, they're bigger than coyotes, so I think they've got to be some sort of, like, koi wolf which is basically like a mixture of a wolf and a coyote together yeah. like kind of a hybrid type thing or something because he's like he's like he's like i've seen them before and yeah. they're like really big and they're not coyotes but i don't know what they are but um that's probably what i saw but wild definitely well, wild experience um and yeah. I, I wanted to start with this before we got into some of the stranger entities or beings or creatures because Honestly, a lot of my supernatural paranormal experiences have happened through animals. And those, you know, stories aren't always as exciting for people as maybe uh, Dogman. But I think they're equally supernatural, especially when animals do things that normal animals wouldn't do things like run really close to you, things like fly right past you. I mean, I've had those sorts of experiences. Again, you know, um, why why I brought it up specifically, though, is there was one experience I had at a park called Racebrook Park uh, off Racebrook Road in Orange, Connecticut, and there's this big, massive stone at some point along the trail and I always was attracted to hiking here because of that stone. It's this massive stone. You can climb on top of it and get like a really nice view of the forest. And there's all these like chip marks out of it. Like you could tell people had been climbing up it a ton. And just that whole area is very nice. And you can kind of get lost walking in the uh, forest behind the rock. So I'd, I'd do that from time to time. And one time, I can't remember if this was an instance where I was with friends or not, but I remember being with friends there and a black fox. And I don't, I mean, I've never really seen black foxes. I've seen red foxes, you know, or orangey kind of tawny looking foxes, but a black fox ran directly toward a, towards us and then kind of strafed us in a diagonal and kept like its eyes at us as it walked and ran past us this trot it wasn't even like a fear kind of run the way you'd see an animal dash it was like a trot like hey i'm here you're here i'm checking you out and i'm leaving and it was one of those experiences where i'm like i'm really grateful (laughs) that i was there for that you know like god you know thank god you know the one of those kind of experiences but i i wonder you know if these entities whatever they may be work in this way where they can attach themselves to the consciousness of an animal or appear as an animal and um you know disguise themselves or present themselves in a way that isn't as shocking as maybe their true form is or i mean who knows maybe it's a separate class of entities but i i think that that category kind of gets dis kind of not um as much play as as a lot of the more sensational cryptid stuff does, but it's equally cryptid in the the sense that, you know, Native Americans have 
talked about, and not just Native Americans, indigenous cultures around the world have talked about spirits coming in the form of different animals. And, uh, and I think there's a big correlation with certain animals like owls and Sasquatch and the dogman too. I mean, maybe it has a form where it's humanoid. Maybe it has a form where it appears as a giant wolf. There's tons of dogman stories where it seems to run off on four legs. So yeah, just something I thought would be neat to, you know, touch on before we got into the uh, the little people. And I wonder, because there are some fairy stories uh, from Europe where little people ride on the backs of, like, bumblebees or birds or other things like that. I wonder maybe if these little uh, people, the uh, Makisuwug or the, uh, wait, let no, let's say that right, Makia Wisig or the Pukwudgi, uh, maybe they have a similar relationship with local animals. I mean, it could be that they, you know, uh, like many animals, have a symbiotic relationship and warn each other when there's danger, things like that. Yeah, as far as the Pukwudgi, this is something that I've learned recently. Now, obviously, I it's only like one source. And so there's a lot of things with Pukwudgis that are like very one source there's certain things that are like universal throughout and there's other things where you don't see a lot of documentation about it but i have seen that there is a possibility that they can as far as legends say they can change into other animals sometimes Hmm. kind of like i was also doing a little research before we hopped on about the wampanoags they said the same thing about hobo muck as well because hobo muck to them is a little bit different than the hobo muck that you described from the mohegans i think i said that right now um, <laughs> so it's a little different than that. Um, so which it's just, you know, we've talked about that off air, like how the differences between the tribes is just so strange anyway, um, being so close to, in relation to one another. Um, but as far as the puck wedges and the transformational stuff, I thought that angle was interesting. As soon as you started talking about that, that's what popped in my head because I'm like, oh, there is a part of the puck wedgie thing where they can possibly turn into other animals, um, to either scare people and, and to lead them to their doom. Like, that's another angle of it. Because, yeah, they do, like, tr- pay tricks on people, too. And that possibly could be part of the tricks that they play. Turning into animals to scare people to, like, either push them into some sort of danger that they are don't know about or even, you know, save them. Like, which is a very strange contrast with the puck wedgie. It's like, <laughs> like I said, on multiple podcasts. Like, I don't know if I trust something that, <laughs> can either save me or kill me, but I'm not sure which one I want to do. So we'll see. You know what I mean? That's yeah. essentially what the attitude of a puck wedgie seems like. Yeah. You know, you don't like, leave, oh. <laughs> leave your fate in such frivolous hands. They seem yeah. temperamental <laughs> <laughs> for sure. And they're very little hands, you know? So like, yeah, I don't know, you know, like, yeah, it's very strange. And then the other little people, the Mika Wiesogs, they don't, I didn't find anything about them turning into other, um, animals or anything like that but with them they do the only thing i know about them as far as anything like that they're the similarities between the two that i found the most interesting is they both disappear hmm. um they like the little the little people the miko Wisugs, they would disappear if you stared at them okay. too long huh. more of like don't stare at me type of thing if you stared at them they would point their finger at you and then you would never see them again right um, so that's like their angle, whereas the puck wedgie would more so disappear when it was convenient for them. Huh. Um, more of like a tactical disappear, like um, to hide or um, so like, yeah, it's just interesting. Like I'm still on the fence of whether they're the same thing or they're related. Like I'm still like trying to figure out if they're because it's just so strange. Like the word puck wedgie was like borrowed from like a Maryland tribe or something. Um, where the original Pukwudgie story comes from, but it was borrowed from another, um, I think it was a Wampanoag leader or Narragansett maybe, don't quote me on this because I'm now forgetting, I think his name is Chief Red Snail, I could be wrong about that, but he was the one that borrowed the phrase Pukwudgie to identify what this thing was or whatever Okay. Um, a little bit later on, So, which is why Pukwudgies are... In Maryland, they're Indian in Indiana and Massachusetts. They're kind of like oh, in yeah. a couple different tribes right. and stuff. And I think that's the reason why is because for whatever reason, they took the name from other tribes. Yeah. Well, and, and um, you know, it's it's interesting. Like nowadays we think of, you know, 
uh, groups of people in this like sense of nations and countries, but tribes as we know them in America pre you know Columbus were not so um, solid in one place. They were more fluid, and a lot of the the migration we're told was from west to east so multiple different cultures from different places settled the east coast and there was tons of trading between the great lakes and the east coast so certainly tracks that they would have similar folklore and maybe different names for these beings but i wonder if it's similar to like what we see in european folklore where you have different classes of these beings you have the fairies the elves the gnomes the brownies all different shapes sizes and having different you know temperaments and characteristics you know similar stories come from fairies you know now we think of disney world and you know fairies are cute and fun loving but there is a whole story of fairies offering people uh different foods that then trap them and make them stuck in fairy world, similar to what it sounds like Pukwudgies are doing. Uh, but are the Makia Siwug, are they similarly described as far as characteristics go and like description, like body description, or are they smaller than the Pukwudgie? They are smaller than the Pukwudgie. Okay. And they're described as like little humans. Okay. So just like just like a human, just small. Huh. Um, whereas a puckwudgie is more described as completely covered in hair. Right. Three, three, anywhere from three to four foot tall. I've heard reports of possibly up to four, but probably and somewhere to two to three foot tall. Whereas these little people seem to be more foot or lower, or right. seem to be much smaller. Like like as you like you were saying, fairy folk. Mm. They seem to be more described like fairy folk. Um, so there is, yeah, very interesting, which begs a question. Is it one of those things that over time the Pukwudgie kind of just replaced all of these things and they just kind of became one thing? You know what I mean? You know how legends over time, just like the game of telephone we like used to play when it's kids, right. you know, it starts off with one message and then over time through wars, through loss of history, through I'm sure a bunch of, and all of a sudden things are kind of get jumbled up and these little, um, little people kind of get lost by the wayside. At least that's what it appears to me because outside of this book, Spirits of New England, that's the only reference I've even seen to them. Mm. And I've looked up a lot of Pukwudgie stuff, looking up their lore. None of them ever mentioned it. So it's like, I don't know if it's one of those things where it's just lost to history or it, like you said, things get mixed up and then people just assume all of them are Pukwudgies and mm. you know what I'm saying? So I think you're right. I think that there is multiple different kinds quite clearly based on evidence I've done and responses I've gotten back. It seems like there's multiple different kinds of them well, and um, they're all like coexisting together. It seems. I think now is a, a good time to tell you my story and maybe this will lead to us uh, meeting up and doing an expedition uh, to Makamuda state park. Cause one of the things that uh, kind of connects to what we were just talking about is at Makamuda State Park, they have these little, um, they almost look like bird houses, but they're little people houses, and people who live in the area create them and leave them in the forest. I don't know who or when this tradition started. They look pretty modern, like somebody had done it as like a social media kind of fad and took a cute picture of it. But nonetheless, the the tradition of like leaving these little beings offerings it kind of follows suit where they have these little you know houses that they build for these creatures and just leave them one of them that was kind of cool was in a, a hollow in a tree they built a little door and on it it said hell's kitchen and when you open the door inside the hollow they had like a little kitchen basically like a miniature <laughs> kitchen with a little devil theme going on so there's a little bit of good a little bit of bad you know and the, the devil kitchen thing but uh i thought that was kind of interesting i don't know how much little people lore i've seen written about makamudis but what is written is that um hp lovecraft which i'm sure you know was a new englander for some time uh he wrote a story that was inspired by the makamudis noises and that kind of gave more attention to this whole folklore which may have preserved it but the story goes is that the Native Americans believed that Habamalco uh, lived below the ground in this underground sort of cave that had like a throne of jewels and 
you know, all these spirits. And from that place, he would knock and make these big noises, these thunderous booms. And uh, even like seismologists and people today notice like there's an odd amount of seismic activity coming from this small place in Connecticut. So even to this day, the whole like Makamudis noises are heard and scientists aren't really sure what it is, whether it's something going on underground, gases or what. But the Native Americans believe that these noises were from this, uh, this spirit, this god. And when my girlfriend and I went and explored the park, we heard a big boom, almost like a gunshot. And what's weird about it is it doesn't, it almost sounds like it came from behind you. But then like if you hear it again, it sounds like it's coming from another direction. Like there's this like directionlessness to the noise. It's hard to pinpoint, I guess, is a better way to describe it. But I remember feeling like kind of strange when we heard it and also excited, like, oh, like we're here. We heard it. Awesome. And then after that, going following with what I was telling you before about the animals, we see this giant, I mean, massive. I have a picture of it on my Instagram, massive black snake. And I would guess it's a rat snake or a water moccasin, something like that, uh, that are local to the area. But it had just gorged on something because it was just sitting in the middle of the path uh not moving at all uh, it's sort of soaking in the sun on this you know summer day and it was kind of startling to us because i mean i don't see snakes often in connecticut sometimes you'll see them along bodies of water but uh sitting in the middle of the path like that almost blocking the entire path like this thing was at least five feet long it was huge i mean that might be an exaggeration but it was big for snakes around here and uh yeah we kind of gave it its space and walked past it as we went down the trail but that was uh in my girlfriend's opinion that was the evil spirit obamoko in the form of the snake right and uh, I'm sometimes a little more skeptical towards things like that myself, but I, I trust her sense of things. She's definitely more intuitive than I am and uh, more in touch with the spiritual world than I am. So um, that, you know, kind of stuck with us. And uh, yeah, again, like I think you noticed this, I'm sure, but like these places can leave things with you, so to speak. Have you noticed that? Like, do you as a Christian, have any protocol um, as far as, like, prayer or things that you say before or after leaving a place like this, like, so that these kind of maybe negative spirits don't follow you home, that kind of thing? Yeah, definitely. Um, I usually say a prayer before I go into a place, and then um, when I leave as well, hmm. um, you know, prayers of protection when I go in, and then prayers that no, no, protection on the way home and that nothing will follow me home. Mm. Um, I've only had one instance where I felt a little off when I left a place and it was one time where I forgot to pray and it was before I got home and I was like, and so I prayed in the car and then that feeling subsided and it went away. So I find as long as I do that, I'm usually pretty good. Um, I've never had anything um, follow me home. Thank God like that. Mm. I will say I've had things like go as far as to be in the car with me, um, which is a very, very strange. I can tell you that experience real quick um, just because it's a quick story. I was in the F Bridgewater Triangle, Freetown State Forest, Profile Rock. We we're talking about it earlier. That same video. I'm leaving the spot. I'm in my car. And so uh, in my car, when you plug in your phone, I was listening to a podcast before. So it'll pick up, you know, wherever you left off on the podcast, it'll pick up and start playing like most people's cars do. So I get in the car, turn it on, I plug in my phone, it starts playing. And it's supposed to be two guys on the podcast, a host and the guest. But all of a sudden, in the midst of them talking, there's a female voice that says, hey. And so I know for a fact there's no, there's not supposed to be a female on this episode. So I go back, I listen to it again. There's no female there. There's no voice there. And wow. so luckily for me, I had my iPad recording still and it was next to me in my car and I caught it on, I caught it on the audio on there. So I played on the clip I made for it. I obviously play the clip of the podcast and then I play the other clip that I caught in the car and you could hear it clear as day. And what's weird about it, I can't tell if it came through the speakers of the car or if it came through, like if it was in the back seat, you know what I'm saying? Where the voice came from, mm. which I mean, 
either way is creepy. Don't get me wrong. If it's coming from the back seat, that's creepy. If it's coming through the speakers, that's probably even creepier. <laughs> that's the first <laughs> you know? podcast poltergeist I've ever heard of. That's incredible, yeah, right? Isn't that wild? <laughs> yeah. that, dude. So like that, I've had that happen before. Right. Um, so that's interesting. Um, what was your original question that got me off on this tangent? Cause I have, I want to go back and circle back to what, um, the well, original question was because now I'm like uh, I've lost the, the of protocol as far as like prayer and when you're yeah. leaving a space that could be or is haunted, right? Right. Okay. So, th- um, thank you. So, what I was going to say with that is I, I haven't had too much anything like bad fall me home or anything like that, but I will say I've had experiences where editing footage will bring back the feelings I felt during the video. Or like this just happened recently. We did a video in Tennessee, Elkmont, where it was just one of the darkest videos or investigations I've ever done. We felt like we were being stalked, watched, um, all that kind of stuff. And in the moment, in the time, it felt like we really weren't getting a lot of evidence. But then when we, we when I went back and went over the evidence, there was just a ton of evidence to go over. And just like a whole bunch of things happened. Uh, but it just was just a very dark video. So much so that I almost like put a disclaimer on because even while editing it, like I could feel that same feelings I felt that night. Um, I had problems with the video editing it like it froze on me. I almost lost the video like I had so many issues with it. So I've had instances like that with that video particularly. And then Anna on Rock, I had some similar feelings with that video, like just like darker sort of feelings because um, I became aware that there is possibly a darker presence at Anawan Rock that I wasn't aware of at the time that someone let me know afterwards. And then I was like, well, that makes sense why I'm like feeling how I'm feeling. Um, so I've had the, that kind of stuff happen, which is weird. So it's like and then the moment I'm done editing the footage and it's uploaded and I delete it from my phone, all those feelings are gone. Um, so it's just like almost like a residual of whatever darkness was there or something on the the video clip itself. You know what I'm saying? Because if you're listening to EVPs or whatever, and this is a dark entity or something, we'll just say, for example, and you're listening to their voice all the time and Lord knows what else is on the video that I can't see. I can't hear, you know, cause like you said, maybe they're in a different spectrum. We can't see them. So Lord knows what's, you know, what else is on this video that we're not perceiving. Um, so, you know, it's, it's definitely weird. So I've had instances where that's happened, which is weird. Yeah, that kind of reminds me of something slightly unrelated that I heard about the music industry and some of the cult theories about certain musicians and how they like imprint, you know, weird uh, rituals or sigils and things on records so that once they copy that record, it's it's sort of like on the who knows just not the audible portion of the music, you know, you're not actually hearing what they did to the master tape but there is this residual haunted kind of effect i don't know how true any of that is but i have heard about that from like uh bands like led zeppelin doing something like that in the past and other people copying them uh i I say that as i'm wearing a coat with a led zeppelin patch on (laughs) so i'm definitely not you know disparaging (laughs) led zeppelin right but yeah it's it's strange stuff for sure and that's why this conversation about where technology meets the paranormal is fascinating because i don't fully think you know people can have their opinions on this but i don't think we fully understand the technology we're inventing i think we invent it And it's still a sort of uh, open kind of process of understanding the full limits or potentials of what we're able to create and interact with. And, you know, when it comes to these supernatural entities, oftentimes researchers who go after the cryptid subject, they, they take maybe a scientific approach with these things, but... When it comes to something like Sasquatch or even Pukwudgie, there's often factors involved with these experiences that defy it being a physical, biological entity, right? I mean, one thing with the Pukwudgie that stands out is a story of a person almost feeling hypnotized by one of these beings. And I have heard similar things occur in Sasquatch encounters. So is there a... a, any like Native American lore or just uh, sort of folklore in general that you've heard that corresponds with that, that idea that these beings are 
more than just some kind of little unknown creature running around. Yeah, so this is where it gets murky with the Pukwudgie, because the only story I've heard, um, whereas like a more of a, a positive story, it was originally attributed to Pukwudgies, but now I'm not even sure if it's a Pukwudgie story or if it's a Mika Wiesug story, but I'll tell you it. Um, just because I think it's interesting. And it's this is what's weird about the Pukwudgie lore and legend, and I'm still doing research on it to try to, like, find more stories because there really isn't a lot of, at least in Wampanoag in, in general, there really isn't a lot about them that is known um, besides the very little fact that at one point, as far as the Wampanoags are concerned, at one point, humans and Pukwudgies got along and giants and Pukwudgies got along. And then something happened to the Pukwudgies where, at least according to the the Wampanoags, they're, they turned evil or they, they turned evil in some sort of a way. Something happened to them. Now, the Wampanoags say that they became jealous of the Wampanoags' love for the giants. And so the, the Pukwudgies got jealous of that. And so that's where the conflict between the humans and Pukwudgies started. But that's part of that angle, too, where... They used to get along, but then they became jealous um, of the giants and stuff like that. So that's kind of part of it. Now, outside of that, there is one story that I know where, like I said, I'm not sure. Now, at first, I thought it was a Pukwudi story. But now that I found out about the Mika Wiesugs, I'm like, this could be a, a them instead of the Pukwudi. But I'll tell you it. So the story goes, uh, this Wampanoag woman was doing her daily things and... There's a great, uh, I think it was a storm or some sort of storm happens, and this little Pukwudgie or Mika Wiesug, I'm not even sure now, comes to the Wampanoag woman and is like, I need your help. My my loved one, the, this is the man Pukwudgie, I guess. Um, my woman is in trouble. She needs, she's sick. She's dying. She needs your help. So basically, it's they like ask for help. And so they're like, okay. And so, um, I believe they blindfold the the woman so she can't see where they live and stuff like that. But it's almost described, at least in the story, like it's as if it's another place. Um, another, not I'm sure if it's another realm or whatever, but it, it's a different place. And so she goes there. She goes into their home. Um, she sees that the, the woman Pukwudgie is hurt. Um, she heals them or whatever, takes care of them. Um, for the night or whatever, and then by the morning, the Pukwudgie's good to go, all healed up. The the other Pukwudgie thanks them profusely um, for their help or whatever, and they, like, you know, let them on their way. And that's, like, one of the only, that's the only positive Pukwudgie story I've ever found. Most of, like, uh, any other reports of them are them leading to people to their doom and stuff like that. And it's just weird, because, like I said, there's not a lot of information about Pukwudgies. It's one of the smaller... No pun intended. One of the smaller like cryptids out there. So like unlike Bigfoot or Sasquatch or um, even Dogman has more details about it. With the Pukwudgie, there really isn't a lot of details and stories out there. Like I, I can like even if you search it online, there really isn't a lot on there. And then if you get books, like they all kind of say the same thing, and it's basically the same story. And then there's a few things added on here or there where like they could possibly be soul stealers and like i said the the shape-shifting part of them like those are two aspects i've only seen one book say that they can do so like i don't know where that stands on like pukwudgies and stuff you know what i mean because it's, it's like it's very strange to only have one report of that in one book so i'm like i'm still trying to find more research i really would like to get in touch with some wampanoags that know like wampanoag history and to really find out like more details about Pukwudgies than what I've been finding because it's just very like basic level stuff. And it's really hard to get any sort of deeper level than just like the basic stuff yeah. that you'll find, you know, because like you said, like I was saying, it's just like there's not a lot out there. And it's lucky that we even know what the Mika Wiesug is, you know, that it's even in this book. Right. Because if it's, if it's not in this book, there's no way that we know about it. So it's it's uh, I've talked about this many times before, but like we're definitely on the precipice of losing history as far as some of this stuff goes yeah. just because if it's not you know for people like us looking into it and trying to figure out stuff you know a lot of this stuff would just go by the wayside especially the king phillips war the 
the legend stuff that like I'm sure there's more legends that about these creatures, the Pukwudgies, the little people, and probably other things out there that are in Wampanoag legend that I don't even know about yet. Mm. You know, or other Native American tribes that, that correlate to what's going on here or what's going on in Connecticut. You know what I mean? Because I feel like all this stuff is intertwined for sure and it's all connected somehow. Well, a big, um, a big so. part of Massachusetts's history is the, you know, English and their interaction with the Native Americans not always being so uh, favorable, at least towards the Native Americans, right? And one thing that's interesting about Rhode Island that might help for your purposes in researching is Rhode Island was founded by uh, Roger Williams, who was uh, essentially kicked out of the place that he lived in in Massachusetts for his you know, kind of uh, liberal at the time beliefs and maybe more inclusive at the time for their standards. Nowadays, he'd probably seem like a conservative, but, you know, for those times, pretty liberal and wanted to include the Native Americans in an equal way in his government. So maybe my guess would be, I'm just spitballing here, but my guess would be there would be more information in tribes that were sort of unscathed so to speak rhode island being one of them connecticut you know the mohegans they made a deal with the connecticut government and kind of allied with them at some point which is probably why they preserve those stories but unfortunately like in this part of the state that i live in and in western massachusetts as well a lot of those tribes got pushed west out of the state and maybe blended with other tribes like the Cherokee where as you were sort of hinting at before with that game of telephone analogy like these stories just kind of blended into similar stories and names get changed as the languages get changed and like the Scaticoke nation that's in Connecticut is like a total hodgepodge of the tribes that were there when the first you know settlers came and started taking their land right and there's the Pogasset tribe down in Bridgeport, but you know, other than that, there's very small um, contingencies. There's still many tribes and many Native Americans today that you know aren't a part of any formal tribe. But yeah, it's it, it's. I think that's a, a reason why we don't have a lot of the myths and legends that other regions in the world have, because there's this you know unfortunate uh, genocide, so to speak. Uh, you know displacement maybe is a more uh, lighter term to use but it's somewhere in between that spectrum of genocide and displacement and when that happens you know people's stories get altered and lost and that's a big reason why i've looked into the stone because something like stone is very hard to change unless you just obliterate it altogether which unfortunately has happened especially with the development of roads and whatnot i mean there's tons of roadside stones that you can see were blasted away and who knows what those stones looked like before the road came and there could have been petroglyphs or who knows what on them but one interesting uh, petroglyph is on dighton rock in massachusetts and yeah i might be mistaking this but please correct me if i'm wrong are there um some sort of pictures on there that maybe let lend the idea that the Native Americans were drawing like mythical beings or not mythical, but Pukwudgy possibly, or am I thinking of another petroglyph? Um, there's a lot of different that on that stone, there's a lot of different carvings on it. And there's like, I think three different theories on who could have done it. Mm. There's the Native American theory that they're like the Wampanoags did it or something. Um, this, for whatever reason, I'm not sure what the purpose would be. Um, and then there's the Viking theory, there's a Phoenician theory, and then there's like a Portuguese theory. Um, like different explorers and stuff may have used it. So I'm not exactly sure like who did it myself. I did do a video there. I wasn't able to like get inside. I would love to go back and like ask more questions because I did that video like really early on in my like paranormal investigations. Um, so uh, to answer your question, I'm not sure exactly who built it, but that's one of those things that like somebody found and no one really knows who drew it or whatever. Right. So it's definitely one of those things that's a mystery still to this day. 
And um, it's definitely interesting. It also reminds me of, have you heard of, um, there's another place very similar to that where it's up in Salem, New Hampshire. They, I forget what they call it. American Stonehenge. Yes. Have you been there before? Well, have you... I have, but uh, I didn't make it past the um, gift shop because <laughs> the there, you know, we were at the end of the leg of our trip and didn't have money for the, uh, I don't know, admission fee at the time. I don't know if that still is a thing prior to COVID and all that, but um, this was pre-COVID, and yeah, my buddy and I went and checked it out, and we didn't end up going to the site, but we did check out some of the artifacts that they had in their museum gift shop area um and yeah it's it's fascinating and i kind i'm glad we segued into dighton rock unless you have more to say about american stonehenge because it kind of brings us into this realm of uh the hidden history of america and the idea that the native americans could have co-mingled with europeans much earlier than columbus and the portuguese and the spanish sailing across the ocean you know it's possible that Celtic and Viking, obviously the Vikings are more well documented, but it's possible that, you know, these groups that have fairy lore and all this sort of stuff that we're familiar with from Europe, they could have been a, a not a the origin of the Native Americans, but somebody who maybe um, mixed in with them, right? And there are plenty of Native Americans that have, we'll call it, caucasian features and that's a whole controversial area of discussion with the welsh tribes and all of that stuff uh but you know giants and little people are all part of that folklore and the stone structures too so in my mind i'm like why is there a gap here like why all of a sudden did they come to this part of the world and they're like nope never this is all separate has nothing to do with the rest of the world this is just native americans you know And I'm not trying to encroach on Native American pride or their ownership of this land or anything like that. Uh, But I think that that might be why we don't have that whole story of uh, of the European pre-contact, because there's this whole political nature to the thing. And maybe that's why we don't have Pukwudgies, uh, (laughs) more information about them. But I feel like I've been on my soapbox a little bit here. I, I need to get off and uh, ask you some more questions because you've done tons of interesting research. And um, aside from the stone, wood is semi-permanent. Trees, you know, they last a long time. And we mentioned the witching tree earlier, which you did a video on, uh, available on Exploring with Phil. Two L's, folks, it's linked in the YouTube. Uh, The description has got it all linked, so go and check it out. But tell us about the... uh, witching tree what's what's up with that is that connected to where like they hung witches or something so yeah that's like the urban legend of the witching tree basically yeah it's a place where capital punishment took place uh witches were hung um people uh on the outskirts of society basically were punished and allegedly um you know they then ended their demise ended their life there um one way or another so what's weird really strange about this urban legend is it's just that I can't, I couldn't find, now there might be, I have to still do more research. I have to really, I have, I'm going to have to like go like to the town of Halifax where this place is located to like actually try to find out what's going on here. But the herb, that's the urban legend is that it was a, a, a tree where capital punishment took place. People were punished, killed, executed, stuff like that. So when I tried to find like research on this, you can't, like I said, you can't really find a lot. All you can find is that one article of saying that this is a legend and this is why it's a legend. So with a with a spot like that going into it where you don't really have a lot to go off of, where it's just like, I mean, it's essentially hearsay, essentially, is the legend. You know, it's just like someone said this. So it's um, it was definitely one of those ones where there were some locations you have a lot of history where it's like, oh, this took place here. We know this took place here. These are the things where a spot like the witching tree, you don't really have that. So you just kind of go off the legend and you go in there and you see what happens. And so going into it, I wasn't expecting all that much, just given there wasn't a lot of history based off it. So, you know, I'm thinking like there isn't a lot of history here. It's just an urban legend. I'm probably not going to find a lot here. Um, Yeah, there are is a cemetery. So like, oh, maybe I'll find something at the very least. It'll be a cool story, a cool video. So when I got there and I started investigating, I mean, even in the moment 
when I was there, I heard multiple voice, like multiple voices and things live. So when I, when I did the video, I knew that I was like, Oh, I'm going to find stuff here because I heard stuff, you know, there with my own ears. That wasn't, you know, I, I know. Cause if you look this for those who haven't seen it, um, it basically it's just a huge field with like one tree in it. <clears throat> and then at this one tree, there's a couple gravestones there of a few people that have been buried there. Um, it seems to be like it could be a family plot, but then again, there's like, it's not really a family plot because there's two or three different families there, which is interesting. Um, and it's very strange because, you know, in New England, like, you know, there's cemeteries almost everywhere, you know, and there's a lot of small cemeteries. And sometimes, you know, if they had a family farm or something, they would bury their family all in one particular spot and stuff like that. But with this cemetery, it doesn't seem like that's the case. It seems like these people have been put aside or in a different spot for a certain reason or something. Mm. And the paranormal evidence that I got there seems to back that up. Now, I've been there twice. The second time I went, I got this, I kept on getting responses that seemed like some sort of battle <clears throat> or fight took place there or something because I kept on getting these responses like as pointing to some sort of event that took place there where people are going to be fighting, people were killed or, you know, some sort of event. Like I said, I haven't found any historical evidence to back any of this up. This is just what I've caught in evidence. So, um, yeah, the witching tree was wild. So one of the other things I caught there, which I thought was super interesting, um, was I was like, you know what? Let me ask about the tree. <clears throat> and I was like, what would you do? And this is in the spirit box. I was like, what would you do? if like someone tried to cut this tree down and um, they said something to the effect of like um, ghosts are coming or like, you know, like we're like literally meaning like ghosts are going to come out of the tree and haunt these people. If they cut this tree down, but, like that's essentially what I took right. it as. Yeah. Cause like, it seemed like the tree itself was the energy surrounding this paranormal haunt or whatever. Yeah. And the moment I mentioned like, oh, um, like this tree's kind of dying. What do you, what would you do if you cut the, if I cut, they cut this tree down, they, like, they immediately got upset about it. Um, so, which is definitely interesting that, which points to the significance of like, you know, rocks and trees having some sort of significance and power. Like even this tree that's ha like this tree is half dead. It's like hanging down. It's basically half alive. It, it's barely alive at this point. But here we get an evidence uh, of like a spirit, a ghost, or whatever it is, entity or something, basically saying, don't cut down this tree. If you cut down this tree, ghosts are going to come out and we're going to come get you, basically, you know, which is wild, you know. And that's the second tree I've done where I've gotten like paranormal evidence are circulating just a tree, which well, is weird. And both of them were half dead. Not, not as wild as you might think when you... Compare that with, you know, ancient lore about tree spirits and guardians of trees. I mean, even the dog man sighting, you know, kind of reminds me of these ancient legends of uh, cemetery guardians, like what Anubis was to the Egyptians and whatnot. It's really, I mean, I think trees have a special energy to them just inherently, but maybe in the sense of the paranormal, you know, they reach into all realms right the underworld the above world the heaven right i mean it's it's kind of like all three right the whole um tree of life motif i wonder if there's an energetic truth to that where you know maybe these trees have uh guardian spirits associated with them you know they're certainly old enough to <laughs> have a uh you know credible amount of uh a big net to, to catch something like that. We'll just say, <laughs> you know, they exist yeah. for a long, long time. So, you know, as far as memories go, trees certainly have uh, some incredible memories if they do think like that. But yeah, the witching tree, it kind of, it kind of reminds me of like, uh, like this idea that, you know, there's again, this, I think it's pan, not thinking pans i want to say panspermia but that has to do with like space and whatnot i'm not thinking of that at all it's more like um panpsychism but that's not really quite it but this idea that kind of what we were talking about before that different landscapes have a consciousness to them or an energy to them beings that populate them that we don't 
necessarily interact with with our five senses and i think new england just being an old old place has tons and tons of examples of (laughs) little nooks and crannies haunted places weird forests you know uh when it comes to Bigfoot, we don't have that many Bigfoot sightings, but are there Bigfoot sightings in the Bridgewater Triangle? Yeah, absolutely. There's been a lot of historical, like, famous sightings. Uh, Joseph DeAndre's sighting is probably the most famous one. He's in the Bridgewater Triangle documentary. If people have seen that, then you know what I'm talking about. Um, So, yeah, there's been a few. His sighting is probably the most famous one. That happened in Bridgewater, the town of Bridgewater. Uh at Sandy Pond, I believe, his experience. So to answer your question, yes, there has been a couple reports and sightings of Bigfoot. There was one in the Huckamuck Swamp in the 70s or 80s with a bunch of children where it was the winter time, and it was either winter break or whatever. The kids were off of school. The If it gets cold enough, the, the, the Huckamuck Swamp will freeze over. And so you can walk it on the ice. So these kids were playing out there. They're like, let's see how far out we can go. And so they go about, I don't know how far out, 100 feet out into the swamp or whatever. And all of them, like group of this is a group of children, see this Bigfoot type creature all covered in white, either covered in snow or, or white fur, whatever the case may be. And it scared the living daylights out of all of them. They all ran off and ran home and everything like that. So that's, there's, a been a bunch of documented sightings of Bigfoot okay. recently. Um, when the last time I was in the Huckabuck Swamp, I asked if Dog Man was there, and in the spirit box it said the Bigfoot, huh. which is very interesting. That's the first time I've got Bigfoot or the Bigfoot or anything like that in Huckabuck Swamp. Wow. And on that same particular night, which is very, very weird, in the moment I didn't really think much of it because it just didn't really think much of it. But then retrospectively thinking about it, especially going there afterwards, because I've been to the Huckamuck Swamp a bunch of times, and I've been to this particular spot a lot. So I know the landscape, I know the smells, I know what it usually is like. So on this particular night, we're walking through, and we get to this one particular area, and it just smells musty, damp. It just smells like doesn't smell like anything I've ever smelled there before. And at the time, I'm like, well, it's a swamp. Like, maybe it just, it's just a night where it smells or whatever. And so then I go back um, on a similar type of temperature, similar type of situation. Doesn't smell at all. And it's never smelled before, hasn't smelled after that I've been through there. So I just thought that was a weird occurrence to get the, you know, because they say with like swamp Bigfoot and stuff like that, they have a certain smell to them. And to get the Bigfoot response in the spirit box, to get that weird smell where I've never gotten a weird smell there before. I mean, just weird. So to answer your question, yeah, there has been Bigfoot stuff for sure. I've had tree knocks out there in the Huckamuck too as well. Um, Obviously, I can't verify who's doing it or what is causing them. But I have asked for, hey, if you're out there, could you knock on a tree? And I've I've had that happen before. So. Definitely, definitely part of the lore and legend of the Huckamuck Swamp for sure. Yeah, and I heard you mention that in your conversation with Tony. But why the Bigfoot came to mind particularly just now is because it kind of going along the lines of like the landscape being conscious. What if the Bigfoot, and this is kind of, um, I guess I'm borrowing and hypothesizing an idea that I'm getting from uh, the whole green man or wild man or pan idea, right? Where there's this kind of like guardian spirit of the forest. Maybe because you look at a place like the Bridgewater Triangle and it's smack dab in the middle of like three huge population centers, you know, Boston, Mm -hmm. you know, New York City. And I'm sure there's another notable, notably large city somewhere in between, maybe Hartford. Right. So there, there you have all these people and you'd think, oh, well, Bigfoot can't be in such a populated place and go unnoticed. It it only exists in the Pacific Northwest where there's remote forests that go for miles and miles. Well, what if it's something altogether not conforming to our normal biological rules maybe it's the swamp itself that's so full of energy and un you know untainted by modernity and roads and power lines and all this stuff that something like a bigfoot can still hold hold its form so to speak and maybe that's why we have legends of these sorts of things in the past in places like 
you know, where New York City stands or where Boston stands. But now that supernatural phenomena takes a, a slightly different form, a more human form than this wild form that the wilderness is associated with. But maybe there are places that are just so powerful that they can kind of create their own wilderness bubble, like the Hockamock Swamp. I mean, this certainly seems to be the case. I don't know if triangles necessarily have a geometric value that would imply supernatural, but you see them, you know, with the pyramid, you see them with secret societies, right? So the Bermuda Triangle, Dragon's Triangle, the Bridgewater Triangle, there's this theme of, of triangles, but when it comes to this particular location, the swamp seems to be the center point. Is there any other maybe locations that are not connected to the swamp that are of note within the Bridgewater Triangle? Because you said the swamp is like right in the center. Yeah, the, the, that would be the heart of the Bridgewater Triangle. I would say the number two, I would say 1A, 1B, depending how you put them, would be the Freetown State Forest. Now, the Freetown State Forest, I would classify as the darker of the two places. A lot of the darker things seem to happen more in the Freetown State Forest. Um, even the Wampanoags used to say that the Freetown State Forest had, uh, like, the evil had dwelt there, which I think is interesting. So even the Wampanoags saying that, that tells me that evil has always been there or somewhere in there. Or, because like, I've had this conversation before with uh, many other people about, like, what the Freetown State Forest and... Because it, it does seem that evil is either attracted there or evil is there and it's attracting other evil to be taken place there. Because there's just too many weird things about the Freetown State Forest concerning, um, you know, rituals, um, people finding like sacrifice animals out there, um, people being murdered out there, um, people being murdered ritualistically out there, um, just people doing bad things like... For example, even something small where it's like, why would someone do this? Someone put, it's a state park, Freetown State Forest. It's a Massachusetts state park. Somebody put um, barbed wire across one of the, this is back in 2011 maybe. Somebody put barbed wire across one of the dirt bike trails. So that way, if you weren't paying attention, you're riding through on your dirt bike, you know, having fun. You know, you could easily hurt yourself or maybe even worse. Yeah. So there's a lot of dark things that are either have taken place in the forest or people have done there. Mm -hmm. You know, um, they found like on the more darker, gross side of things, they found like a pedophile den there where it was like this log cabin thing built into the earth where they found like all these kids clothing inside. They never found who built it. They never found, you know, anything leading to it or whatever. I mean, just a lot of like awful dark things have taken place in this forest or is seem to be attracted to the forest mm. um so and not only that but you also have regular hauntings there you have ufo activity there ronald reagan when he was president was driving through the freetown state forest for some sort of purpose and he saw a ufo there um so that's documented that happened so that's i think that's interesting um Many other myriad of like obviously Pukwudgie activity, but it does seem to be an epicenter of like darker things drawn to it there. Mm -hmm. Now, whether that's because like the of the stories and then people reading those stories and then wanting to go do those evil things. And so they go to that place because they know evil has been done there sort of thing, you know, copycats type stuff or I don't know what the reason is, but it does seem that people are drawn to it to do bad things there. I mean, yeah. we're talking, this is a forest where like, when I bring this place up to people, half of the people won't even go there. You know, mm -hmm. you bring up the Freetown State Forest to some people. Like I have a good friend of mine that tells me like, oh, I don't mind you going to the Huckamuck, but don't go to the Freetown State Forest. You know, because it, it is that evil, you know, like it's just, it's definitely a different, uh, weird and strange place. I've had people reach out to me with like very, very, um, strange and creepy encounters in the Bridgewater Triangle documentary itself. There was a paranormal team that went out there that on this particular lo location, it's called the ledge and where it's an old quarry again with the rocks. I'm glad I brought this up. So it's an old quarry, um, a lot of granite, some slate, stuff like that. 
And so it's basically a quarry where there's like water down below, much like a lot of the quarries we have that they don't use anymore. Um, so no one knows how deep it is. There's been many people that have jumped off, whether that's suicide or otherwise. Like, this place is crazy. So uh, one of the times I went there, right to the ledge, the only time I have went there, I happened to meet this other random guy that was flying his drone around. Really nice guy. He let me use his footage for my video for from his drone. But he was like telling me, uh, um, because his wife is like from the area, knows all the legends and stuff. And he's like, Yeah, I don't really, I'm not like into the paranormal. I just like fly my drone around. But he was, he's like, My wife was saying that like she knew a guy that was out here. They were out here one night. And um, he's one of the guys that allegedly committed suicide and jumped off. But what she, what he was saying, his wife was telling him was like, This guy did not jump off. This guy was pushed off by some, either somebody or some unseen force, or something like that. Wow. And what's really crazy about that story is in the Bridgewater Triangle documentary, a paranormal team goes out there, and they're investigating the ledge. One of their team members like basically gets possessed on the ledge and tries to throw herself off. And so like they all have to like hold this woman down. They're like yelling her name, like, oh, stop, stop, Brent, whatever her name is. I can't remember. Um, so like that's one of the legends of the ledge is like when you get up there, you feel like you want to jump off. Yeah. And like, yeah, so like, it's just a dark place, man. It's just like, I've only been there in my year and a half of doing this. I've only been there three times. Mm. Whereas like I've been to the Huckamuck probably 35 times. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's just not a place I like to go by myself. Like, you know, just cause it has like a darker side to it. So I don't like to provoke or like that kind of stuff. So I try to stay away from it, but it is a hotbed of, like I said, the darker stuff in the Bridgewater triangle is probably happening there. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, respect the decision to steer clear and i think that's why these local lores don't get forgotten you know because there's a truth to them and people do go missing and do get hurt and all over the world there are these regions where strange things happen to people and they get this reputation rightly so and i think that's why we need to rethink our maps you know in the ancient past you'd have maps with like sea monsters at the fringes of the map and like little weird you know drawings in certain places our maps don't have that anymore they're too sterilized they're too secular i think people ought to really consider our world in this mythic landscape sort of term in these terms and realize that the mythic isn't uh, necessarily unreal, right? I think it could feel that way, but when you look at the sheer number of people who have experienced this stuff, and, it, you know, you're you're in where you grew up. Like, this, is, this isn't stuff that you, like, necessarily went out of your way to seek out, right? And I wonder how often that happens to people who live in places that maybe don't have uh, a place with such an impressive reputation, right? Like uh, there's not a lot of documentaries about this kind of stuff, you know, Bridgewater Triangle, Skinwalker Ranch, I mean, Mount Shasta, right? Like there's some, there's some notable places. I probably left a few out, but you know, as far as uh, America, North and South go, there's tons of weird stuff going on. And I think, you know, we really need to to start to investigate this more thoroughly. So I say to you, kudos, and I'm cheering you on the whole way. I hope we can get you down to Connecticut to explore some of the weird stuff around here, get myself out of this stupid desk chair here because I've been sitting around too long. And, yeah, you know, I think my girlfriend and I would uh, definitely enjoy going out and exploring, but... With uh, with that, Phil, we're sort of coming to the close. I think we ought to have another conversation soon about King Philip's War and all the different uh, battle locations and that sort of side of your investigative work because there's a lot more there, and I could probably do a little reading first to get prepared for a subject like that. But this has been so awesome, man, spending the past almost two hours here. Uh, before we go, let the folks know, you know, what, you have planned for 2024 uh folks definitely catch up with phil's work if you haven't if this is your first time hearing about him maybe check out his interviews on the confessionals as well he's a friend of tony's but yeah tell us what your plans are for 2024 with the channel and working with the afk podcast right 
Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So this year, my focus, I am going to pull back a little bit on the YouTube. I was going to do every other week, but I think I'm going to do minimum three videos a month. Obviously, it'll still be the same day, it'll be every uh, Thursday, 7 p.m. So it'll I'll basically just be doing one less video a month. I used to do a video every single week. So I'm just going to pull back just a little bit to give myself, hopefully, a little bit more time to maybe get ahead a little bit. And then so I can maybe start focusing on some bigger projects or bigger ideas. Um, sort of like I wanted to do like a thing on, on Puck Wedgies specifically, just Puck Wedgies, maybe like a longer form documentary or something like that just like literally focusing in on them and then maybe even tie that into the mika we sugs and that as well or so you know sort of a, like a longer form rather than like an episode of just you know about it where i'll go out to the huckamuck swamp multiple times asks the same same questions over and over and then to see you know what kind of evidence i would catch um, based off that and obviously i'll be doing more king phillips war history and paranormal meet together that kind of stuff and then other projects um, besides doing the weekly videos, um, just kind of playing it by year. I would love, obviously, I would love to get involved with you guys. We definitely got to book a date. I want to check out the place that you mentioned we were talking about earlier. And then there's obviously so many other places in Connecticut and in your general area and mind area that we could both like team up on because I'm interested to see what would happen if I investigate at some of these sites that you were talking about. You know what I mean? The the, the you know the, the the old giant mountains or you know any of that oh, stuff because yeah. I feel like I feel like there's definitely paranormal stuff happening there for sure, and I, I think we get evidence there, no doubt. Absolutely, yeah. I'm waiting. Uh, when we're done recording, I'll tell you a few of the spots just so we could leave it a surprise for people uh, in the Hell audience yeah. and maybe keep these places from getting too stomped on, right? Yeah, you know, we wanna for be the, sure. We want to be the first ones there, so to speak. But, uh, but yeah, this is awesome, man. I, I look forward to 2024 and everything to come on your channel with, uh, with what you're doing there. And especially with the podcast, welcome to the podcast realm in a more uh, official way, a uh, capacity. And, uh, yeah, man, unless you have anything else to add towards the end here, uh, we'll wrap it up here. No, I think that's good. You can find me exploring with Phil. That's Phil with two L's and then AFK Discussions Podcast. Right on. Well, with that, folks, go and check that out. The links are in the description. And please immerse yourself in the moment wherever you are in the now.